Okay, welcome back. So, first I will uh, get into the details of today's lab which is based on this uh, network simulator 2. In fact, there is NS3 which uh, is where people are migrating to, uh, but uh, since I am more familiar with NS2, I have used this, you are by all means uh, welcome to use NS3 as well. It has a slightly different interface, but conceptually both simulate various protocols. Uh, you can use either of them for uh, learning purposes. So getting into today's exercise, you have been provided certain sample scripts nstcp.tickle, nssimple.tcl, uh, tcl we call it tickle. And the first exercise is about going through the scripts, understanding how the scripts work by looking at the code as well as running them and then answering some questions based on your understanding of the script as well as experimenting with the script basically running it. You could also see the action in this network animator that comes with uh, uh, NS2. So that is the first portion of the lab. By the way, there is a video that talks about the network simulator. Uh, there is also slides associated with NS2 that have been shared in the Google Drive. If you want to refresh NS2, please go through this material before you start the lab. So let me, so this is a terminal which has uh, the scripts that I have shared with you, nssimple.tcl and nstickle.tcl. So let us just run one of these. So this is the way you use ns, you just say ns, ns dot dash tcp dot tickle, in which case it ran the particular code. We can also see what is inside it briefly. So basically this is how the uh, tickle, how you write the code in uh, tickle. You are basically opening some trace file, once the simulation ends you are defining a procedure that specifies what to do once the simulation ends you are creating nodes. So typically any network simulation involves a topology. So in this topology there are three nodes N0, N1, N2. You are creating links between the nodes. You are specifying how to orient. This is mostly for graphical uh, visualization for NAM. Otherwise it is not necessary for the simulator. You are monitoring the queue and you are setting up TCP connections and you are feeding the TCP connections through some application layer protocol like FTP and you are also specifying when you should start and stop the simulation. It is a very simple script, you can go through it in detail uh, as you explore it uh, in the lab. So if you do this NS, uh, it basically runs it, so once it exited. What you will see as a result of it is it has produced this nam out dot nam which is what feeds into the uh, network animator. Uh, since uh, you could run nam out dot nam but right now since I am assessing SS hitching into my uh, Linux machine this will not work but locally it will work for you. And you could also see the trace file that the NS has produced called tcp.tr. So this says what happened during the simulation. The format for this you can see in the slides that I have shared with you. What does plus mean? What does R mean? What does, so here if you see there is a plus, here there is an R, here there is a minus. What do these things mean? I will let you explore them. So the, as you can see these are all packets that are being sent. Some are TCP packets, some are acknowledgements. Um, there are destination sources, everything is for you to figure out. So whenever you run a simulation, naturally some results that such a trace file is produced and you want to go through the trace file and collect some statistics. The way things are set up in the lab is I am asking you to collect some very simple statistics through the use of grep, uh, pipe, word count. 
So let me demonstrate one very simple thing. So in this trace file which is tcp.tr as you can see lot of packets um, have been transmitted. You will see that some packets represented by D are the dropped packets. Now suppose you want to figure out how many are the dropped packets in the simulation. So a simple way to do this is grep So what I have typed is grep this uh, it is called caret d or it is the hat d what this is basically telling is print out all the lines that start with a d that is what this is telling within this particular file. So when I execute it it printed out all the lines that start with a d. Now it is if you want to now figure out how many of these are there this is pipe, pipe means the output of this file you pass to this particular command wc is a command which stands for word count minus l specifies that count the number of lines in the file and pipe is basically passing the output of uh, this grep which is this thing that you see to w count minus l. So when you do this all you get is a single number basically that has 17 drops. So this is how you can collect some statistics based on the traces. You can do some things even more sophisticated I will leave it all for you as part of the lab. So the first exercise is just a warm up that will let you explore this very two simple scripts and answer some questions based on what you have seen when you go through the code as well as when you run them. So that is the first part of the um, exercise. So there are a few kind of I would not say they are very difficult but it is asked you to calculate the throughput at the receiver of the through two flows. So let me emphasize what I mean by throughput. So when you are measuring something at a destination let us say you started at time T1 and there is time T2. So this is the receiver let us say at time T1 is when it received the first packet and it received let us say the 100th packet in time T2. So between T1 and T2 it has received 100 packets ok. So T2 minus T1 is the time let me call it T seconds within T seconds it has received 100 packets. So throughput will be 100 into whatever is the packet size this could be in bytes in which case you multiply it with 8 to convert into bits. So these many bits were received in T seconds. So that is the throughput at the receiver. So this is what I was asking you to calculate. So the second exercise is involving this topology. So you have to create a tickle file based on you can use the ns simple.tcl as well as ns tcp.tcl the one files that I have provided for you in exercise 1 as a reference to create this particular topology I mean it is very straightforward there is nothing complicated there just look at it look at some of the commands and reproduce it to create this particular topology. So in this topology there is uh, a source there is a router and a destination and they are involving two links this link 1 has a bandwidth of 1 mbps with 50 milliseconds latency whereas link 2 has much lower bandwidth of only 100 kbps and 5 milliseconds. So what you are going to do in this exercise is you are going to send data at a rate that is going to congest this link 2. So as you can see it has only 100 kbps but you will try to send data at twice the rate or whatever is specified. So here the values are 40 kbps is less than 100 kbps that means you are not congesting it. 80 kbps is also less than 100 kbps you are not congesting it but 120 kbps and 160 kbps is greater than 100 kbps thereby you are going to congest the link. So as you push more and so each is a different experiment in each experiment you are going to set uh, so basically with since I have specified 4 data rates you are basically going to run 4 different experiments in each experiment you have to vary the rate in this particular fashion the first experiment you will set it to 40 kbps second experiment you will set it to 80 kbps third experiment 120 fourth experiment 160 kbps 
and in each experiment you are going to see what is going to happen. I mean what are the losses that you are going to see, what is the throughput that you are going to get. So these are the two main metrics you are going to measure. So offered load, so let me get into a little bit details of what you are measuring. So offered load is the rate at which source is injecting into the network, this is what you are setting in the tickle script. How do you set it, again once you go through the script you will understand, but just after you set it you do confirm in the trace as well that you need your injecting traffic at the rate of 40 kbps or 120 kbps or 160 kbps as specified. Now when you are congesting a link naturally you will expect losses, so you need to measure how many packets have been dropped that is the packet loss measurement. Similarly you also have to measure what is the throughput that you are getting when you are uh, congesting or not congesting the network. So this throughput similar calculation is similar as above. So this is what you need to measure and typically whenever you use a simulator it is always good to plot certain um, data. So you are measuring offered load packet losses, you are measuring throughput and it is a good practice to also learn how to graph these results. So for that you are required to plot two graphs, one is the offered load versus percentage packet loss, another is offered load versus throughput. So let me again um, explain a little bit about it. So you have run basically experiment 1 where you used 40 kbps which is your offered load and let us say you experienced um, x1 number of losses. In your experiment 2 you have injected uh, 80 kbps and you saw x2 number of losses. In your experiment 3 you did 120 kbps and you saw x3 number of losses and in experiment 4 it is 160 kbps and you saw x4 number of losses. By the way one thing I wish to emphasize is this is percentage loss that means if you have sent let us say overall t number of packets and l were lost this is l over t. It is not for example if, if in one experiment you send 100 packets and 20 got lost, in another experiment you send 1000 packets and 20 got lost, it is not that the loss rate is the same in both the cases. In this case the loss rate is much less than in the first case. So what you have to plot here is the percentage loss that is what is more relevant not the total number of packets lost because that is a function of how many packets you have actually sent. So ensure that you are measuring percentage of loss. So when you have these experiments, 4 experiments and this is the data that you got out of the experiment, when you are plotting this is basically what you are doing. So this is the x axis, it will have these values 40, 80, 120, 160 and these are the values of x1, x2, x3 and whatever x4. So you may have, I am randomly drawing something like this corresponding to the 4 points and you have to plot something like this. So this is what I expect you to uh, plot. Now in order to plot you are free to choose whatever plotting tool you are comfortable with. You can use uh, open office um, which is the equivalent of excel there is something if you are familiar with windows you can plot graphs in excel. Uh, there is something very similar in uh, open office called xcalc you could use that to plot the uh, figures. Uh, I have also GNU plot is something which we use a lot. I have provided a sample script for you to use uh, GNU plot as part of the lab files. Uh, you can go through it, it is kind of again a straightforward thing. Uh, I am not very sure whether GNU plot is installed on your lab machines. You have to confirm that if it is installed you could use GNU plot. You could use whatever tool you are comfortable with and which is available at your remote center. But finally I want you to plot, excel is something which will very likely be there, you are always free to use that. For those who are interested in doing something more, there is some additional work for you, 
but this is a little bit uh, more complicated in that it will involve some amount of bash scripting or using C code. Uh, you cannot really do it with just grep, pipe and wcount commands like uh, you have done the earlier exercises. Uh, so you are free to attempt this. Um, we have, we will provide solutions at the end as to how to use these commands. Uh, it may appear, so this lab may be slightly more difficult than the other labs, but if you think carefully and uh, just be very clear on what is it that you want to measure, what are the filters you have to use for grep, you can easily calculate whatever it is you want based on just grep, the pipe and the word count. So that is in fact a hint for you to, it's not, it involves nothing more sophisticated or complicated except for exercise 3 which is an optional exercise time permitting you can do or you can do it later as well. Yeah. So this is with respect to the lab, I can take some questions specific to the lab for the next uh, 20 minutes. Madam, I have a question, whatever the trace file we are getting it in the NS2, can we analyze this trace file in the Wireshark? No, this is a totally NS2 based trace file, this is uh, nothing to do with Wireshark, Wireshark expects the packets to have a certain format, it has, to, uh, it's a linear kernel based, the PCAP uh, is what it expects them to be, no, this cannot be used as part of Wireshark. Wireshark is more an implementation thing, this is a simulation thing. I have one more question, how do we introduce a loss uh, monitor in the NS2? It is there in the sample script that I have given. I look in into that. Now. When uh, we had done traceroute to www.google.com, we got a successful response, but when we tried to see the ICMP request and reply packets in Wireshark, we couldn't see them. We got only the ICMP message as host and table. why is it so? I don't know the setup, but it is very likely that maybe you are going through a proxy. So when you are using wget, uh, if you are going through a proxy, you need to specify the proxy settings or whatever. So if the browser has the proxy settings within it, but if uh, wget does not have it. So we do not have proxy settings. You are not using a proxy. I mean, if you, are you able to ping www.google.com at a terminal? If you are not able to ping, then very likely, uh, if ping works, then uh, wget should also very likely work. But if ping itself is not working, that means somehow you are, uh, maybe you are going through a proxy which you are not aware of. So maybe that you have to understand how your network is set up there. Yeah, for uh, trace route to www.google.com, we are not getting ICMP request and reply messages in the Wireshark window. Yeah, oh, that is quite obvious because uh, some router on the way to Google is dropping your ICMP request and, on, and is not replying back. That is very common. I mean, any router, uh, uh, not all routers are going to reply back because it's a load for them. Some good routers or nice routers reply, most routers do not reply. So you will not see in Wireshark those uh, messages because the router is just dropping the packet and is not even sending ICMP reply. That is why you will not see. Okay, thank you. Ma'am, does NS2 support all different kinds of protocols? Or is there any restriction that certain kinds of protocols are allowed? So NS2 is a community effort where most of the basic protocols are there as part of NS2. In fact, it has a whole lot of protocols. But again, it's a community effort. If you are working on some very recent protocol, uh, which you may not find it as part of NS2. But that said, NS2 has quite a lot of protocols. Some protocols it may not have, uh, but often the way it works is if there is no protocol that is there, some research group works on it. Um, develops modules for it and shares it with the community. So that is how NS2 works. It's a community effort. It does have a fairly large number of protocols. Thank you. 1229. Uh, regarding yesterday's lab, I am having one question. Uh, that is when we are trying to uh, ping to a machine which is existing in nature. Okay. Uh, that time what we had found is uh, uh, 
at 3 and co3 is set even though the machine is machine is there machine is working absolutely fine so actually we are not understood how it is because if the machine is off then it's okay but if the machine is working but still we are getting that type 3 and uh, co3 flag set in wireshark let me clarify i'm sure many other centers also uh, have this thing about uh, Whenever you send UDP, you will see this port unreachable uh, message. That send UDP.C when you are running on a particular host, you are specifying some random destination. That machine may very well be up. But within the send UDP program, you are also choosing some random port. So it's not like a commonly used port that is there. So when you send, all you are doing at the sending side is you are assembling a packet to the destination and specifying the port number as this random port and sending it out. Now at the destination, very likely, in fact, we don't want anyone listening onto the port for this experiment, is no one is listening on that particular port. Thereby, when this message reaches that other end host, end host will say port unreachable message because there is no one listening on that particular port. The objective of that particular exercise has to do just with IP fragmentation whereby you are sending out a packet that is going to get fragmented. It is not expecting a reply from the other end. In fact, it does not want anyone to act on that particular packet because you are just sending randomly a packet. You do not want the other end to uh, get confused about this packet. So we chose purposefully a port that no one is going to listen on and thereby send. So the other host is doing the right thing in saying that the port is unreachable. Uh, I wanted to know the difference between packet delivery fraction and throughput. Okay. So packet delivery ratio is if you are sending 100 packets and uh, about 80 packets were uh, received, right? 80 over 100 is your packet delivery ratio because out of 100 you got 80. Throughput takes into account the packet size as well. So in other as well as time. So it is specifically telling that during this time T1 to T2, I have received these many packets of this many bits and thereby that is the calculation. So the first one packet delivery ratio, then there is no concept of time or packet size. It is like you are done doing an experiment where you may send the 100 packets over 100 seconds or 1000 seconds does not really matter. At the end point you are just measuring how many did I receive correctly. That is a packet delivery ratio. Throughput is a little bit more uh, informative. So throughput can be a better metric for quality. It, of is, it depends upon what is it that you are trying to measure as well. So for example, if packet delivery ratio has a correlation with loss rate, sometimes it is inverse of loss rate. So if 80 out of 100 were received, then 20 out of 100 were lost. So it depends on the context. What is it that you are interested in? You may be interested in some context more in the loss rate rather than throughput. For example, if you are dealing with the audio or a video kind of a thing where throughput is not that important. What matters more is what is the losses I am seeing. But if you are dealing with a file transfer protocol, you may worry more about throughput. Madam, if you could throw some uh, highlight on uh, configuration of bash artifacts. Yeah, you need to specify within the terminal where the necessary NS2 uh, uh, folder is because you want to use NS2 from command line. You are not going to go into the directory where it got installed. So you need to specify within the OS where the NS2 file, NS2 executable is. So for all that you need to insert in all this. But uh, there is an NS2 direct Ubuntu installation through sudo apt get install NS2. You could just do sudo apt get install ns2 and that will take care of all this business. So you do not have to worry about all that. Originally ns2 installation involved downloading the tar zip file, unloading it and uh, doing make blah blah. But these days it is lot easier. You can just do sudo apt get install. Thank you. Kathir College. Um, I have a quick question. Uh, huh. What is the difference between uh, trace route and TCP dump? This is my first question. The second question is, if I want to add uh, new features in the header, uh, can I or uh, yeah, where I can see the, these definitions of the header? My third question is, if I run the simulation result more than 5 minutes, my system will automatically go hang. 
So, is there any time limitation to show the simulation result? Over okay. to you, ma'am. So, coming to your uh, first question, what is the difference between uh, TCP dump and trace route? They are very different. TCP dump is basically a monitoring tool of packets that are coming into and outside your uh, going out as well as coming into your host. So, whatever traffic your host is handling TCP dumps tell you tells you what that um, what are the packets that you are getting as well as uh, sending out. The trace route is again a tool that specifies how many what is the path taken by a packet between your host and some destination. So, when you run trace route you could use TCP dump to measure what all packets were sent out as well as received when you are doing uh, trace route. So, trace route is mostly for finding out the path it is a uh, command TCP dump is basically a packet capture uh, tool. So, the second question you have asked is uh, can we change the header fields. So, typically you cannot change because these are uh, so for example, this is all standardized the IP header is standardized the link headers are standardized the transport headers are standardized and they all come with uh, the kernel uh, in uh, implemented as part of the kernel. You can hack the kernel and make some changes, but then you no one else will be able to understand the changes you have made, because the others expect to follow the standard. Now, coming to your third question where you ran some NS2 simulation and it hangs, uh, it depends upon the simulation, uh, how many packets are getting generated, how many. So, typically for every packet that is generated, there is some memory allocated through it internally, memalloc something. Uh, if you are running it for a really long time, it is possible that you are exhausting the memory and specifically if you have hacked NS2 and implemented some protocol, uh, if you are doing memalloc and not uh, clearing when you receive a packet, discarding a packet, you have to clear up that memory space. If you are not doing it as you keep on generating packets, uh, your memory something will happen and there is a possibility of crash. It you have to really debug internally to see what, what is happening. Saroj Mohan Institute. Ma'am, uh, we want to know that uh, about this ma'am TPS system ma'am. When when students are ma'am sharing their uh, suppose they are sharing what they are missing. Okay ma'am. So in this sharing system ma'am, uh, we think that obviously it is going to consume less time. But um, in our class suppose. Uh, we have uh, ma'am say 60 students. So, uh, in the given time ma'am TPS system how, how can we effectively and uh, can we apply this system ma'am that, that is my question ma'am. So, you may have a large class, but that does not mean you pick on every student and uh, uh, go through the particular solu solution of that particular pair. Let us say if there are 60 students, you have 30 groups, you are not going to go through each and every 30 of them, you randomly pick some 3 4 people discuss it and more often than not the 3 4 is going to cover the spectrum and in the next class you pick on some other disjoint set. So, it, it ha you cannot spend all the time. So, you just sample 1 or 2 or at most 2 3 and then you tie in all the loose ends saying that uh, yeah there are these other ways of doing it as well and this is the total conclusion. Thank you ma'am. Srinagar. In NS2, how do we specify which uh, node is a host and which host is a router? So, there is uh, no concept of uh, the router. So, in NS2, everything is a node, and the node has the capability of uh, uh, doing all the required functionalities. So, there is not any segregation as such. So, it will any node will support uh, uh, feeding traffic from the application layer as well as doing some uh, switching in terms of taking something from incoming figuring out what the node address is and sending out on the outside interface. So, there is not such a clear cut distinction between a router and a node. In other words a node implements all the required features corresponding to a host as well as a router. Just one more question ma'am. Huh. Uh, when we create a link, we uh, tell it where to drop the packets. Uh, for example, drop tail tells us to drop the packets that are at the end of the queue. 
can we draw packets at uh, some other place at the front of the queue yes so you can there are a bunch of uh, models for uh, packet loss in ns2 all you need to do is uh, when you are specifying the uh, if you look at the ns uh, script yeah if you see this there is something called drop tail here when you are establishing the link between the nodes you could specify it to something else uh, i don't off hand remember what are the models that are there but it could be random drop anywhere within the queue or it could be at the head of the queue so on so forth so you just have to change that wording drop tail to some other word and it will take care of it mewar institute university uh, how to rectify the losses of bits we have any tool for that so uh, depends i mean you as a you cannot uh, really at the application layer do anything about it but uh, often in wireless networks and all where the loss rates are high you do employ this error correction mechanism where even if some bits are corrupted you add additional information such that you can potentially correct those errors so that is feasible through error correction and there are plenty of uh, error correction codes that you could employ over the data to correct the corruption there is any tool for that i mean what do you mean by tool so all this so if you are talking about an implementation all these things uh, happen at the link layer and uh, these corrupted packets are not even passed up the protocol stack if it can correct it will correct and pass the corrected packets up if it is not able to correct it will just discard the entire packet so you will not see it at the uh, higher layers unless you are doing research in the space and are modifying things at the physical link layer then you can see the stuff and employ some algorithms there so for example uh, there is lot of research in using software defined radios in uh, getting the bit stream and employing some algorithms there to uh, correct the bit error so all this is handled in implementation like that but if you are talking about some simulation and you are doing yes there are uh, libraries i mean you have to i don't have know anything off hand but i'm sure there is code available uh, online you just need to download the code it will be in c or something integrate it as part of your simulator and it will uh, correct the errors if there are any errors in the packet and my question is based on graphical user interface of ns2 VNS is available on internet uh, that provides graphical interface to NS2. What exactly it is? Yeah, this is uh, integrated. I think uh, more in NS3. Uh, so it is uh, just like you have a network animator that you are going to see uh, thing of. Uh, you should be able to set some of the parameters like define the topology that the figure that you have seen uh, instead of. Uh, Uh, manually putting it as part of the tickle you could uh, add drop nodes create links between them even some of the the setting up that this link has 1 mbps 50 milliseconds all that you could do through the gui ma'am can we uh, take the output in x graph yes so yeah so ns2 whatever works for you i uh, uh, you can take the output in x graph but uh, as i said you have to run some the uh, scripts over the trace before you get the data in the format that you want okay thank you ma'am techno india salt lake i have a question regarding uh, how ns2 can be used to cover the wide spectrum of networks regarding simulation and performance evaluation and the second related question around with that can we publish papers in international journals by getting the performance evaluation results from ns2 or ns3 this is regarding the internal details of the software which we are not much aware with that if you can kindly clarify okay so you are basically telling uh, about the protocols and other things that are there as part of ns2 as i said ns2 has a whole range of protocols and uh, it's a community effort many people keep on adding protocols uh, to it since it has a wide range of protocols you could explore through ns2 many things like at the link layer you could ex, uh, psma cd you can uh, explore csma ca you can explore in the wireless space there are plenty of other protocols called macau blah blah so all those protocols are there so you can explore many of them as part of ns2 
Even at the uh, network layer, it does some basic routing. A uh, lot of the contribution comes from the wireless space because that's where a lot of research uh, ideas are. So it has the entire spectrum of DSDV, uh, DSR, AODV, all those protocols that are in the wireless space are there. Even at the TCP level, it comes with various flavors of TCP, TCP Reno, TCP Vegas, TCP uh, New Reno. So it comes with uh, applications also, there are many things that uh, web traffic, uh, FTP traffic, all those things are there. So if you are trying to use it to run a course, you could basically give labs and along different layers for the students to explore. So that way, uh, it's a pretty good uh, uh, tool for uh, uh, using for teaching purposes. Now coming to your next question, whether you could use NS2, NS3 for research publications, definitely. I mean, uh, uh, the most of the simulation work in this space happens through the use of NS2, NS3 because it's open source. Um, and uh, you could write your own protocols. So you, for that, you don't operate at the tickle level. You have to get into the C++ level. Uh, it's a little bit, there is a bit of a learning curve for that. It will take some time for you to understand the internals of uh, NS2. Uh, maybe it may take about uh, three, four months for you to even understand how the different things are uh, um, organized internally. But there are a lot of tutorials also for that. Um, and once you write any protocol, yeah, you could evaluate the details of the protocol through NS2, NS3 and publish that particular work. So in a high level, yes, it is used in the community for research work. In fact, it is more used than any other simulator I'm aware of, like OpNet or other things are less used than NS2. Ma'am, uh, just one related question. Uh, this is uh, uh, regarding the simulation the softwares that you were saying that we can develop simulation softwares using C++ or C whatever. So I have been working in this field over plus past 10, 20 years. Actually, I have been writing simulation codes using C and C++ as well for network simulations and all. So uh, is the NS2 very uh, uh, comfortable with C, C++ code being added to this and uh, evaluation getting done uh, as an addendum process? Yes, that is what the, the front end is tickle, the back end is C++. So uh, it's kind of very straightforward to write modules, except that as I said, the it, NS2 is organized in a certain fashion internally. You need to understand what is the structure within before you can know where exactly you should make modifications. That will take some time, but uh, it is in C++ itself. Yeah, it Information is available in the, in the, in the uh, open source, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. NS2 website, if you visit, they do talk a lot about how it is. In fact, there's a huge documentation of NS2, uh, about 100 page or uh, 200 page document, which talks a lot internally what is happening within NS2. Thank you very much, ma'am. Mirla Institute. Madam, can we, uh, can we do some processing at particular node? Suppose that node, at that node, two other uh, data from two other nodes is coming. And we want to do the processing with that data, like XOR operations. Can we do at, at what place we can do in NS2? See, if you want to do anything that is involving at the protocol level, you have to get into the C++ portion of it. It's not, so tickle is just a configuration, uh, like specifying what the link capacities are or specifying uh, whether it's a drop tail or some other. So that is, it's basically configuration you do via tickle. Any functionality you want to implement, you have to dig in at the C++ level. Uh, so you have to get in at the, within the node, you have to implement whatever functionality you want. You have to identify where is the right place to implement this functionality and code it. Yes, you can implement it, but you can't do it at the tickle level. You have to do it at C++ level. When we are going for the source code, so many things are there. Yes. So, but where I can do this processing, like simple operation, like one oper XOR operation if we, want, we are interested to do. So, I mean, uh, it has been ages since I have uh, looked into inside the uh, thing, but uh, this, so typically within a node, there is a structure to a node. If you look up at that NS2 documentation, it will tell you how things are organized within a node. You have to 
capture the right place within I mean I cannot tell offhand without uh, looking at that particular structure. But if you download the NS2 documentation there are figures on that will specify exactly how the modules are organized within a node. You have to see and it will also explain what each module is doing. You have to capture the point where the two packets are coming in some queue and there is where you have to implement this functionality. So madam when, when we are see this is open source uh, network simulator. Yes. When we are comparing any means like licensed uh, network simulator. So are we are going to get the similar results or it will be there will be any difference like uh, Qualnet if you are utilizing mm -hmm. and uh, going for same topology and same data rate and same uh, protocols are we going to get the same results or different result between NS2 and uh, Qualnet or any. So it uh, depends upon the scenario and a uh, lot of so if something is very complex. I may suspect things may be different between two simul different simulators, but some things that are very similar at least the nature of results will be same if not the exact value. For example, in some case if you got loss rate to be 2 percent, another case you may get loss rate to be 2.1 percent, but it will not be 10 percent. Uh, so that level of similarity I think will be there, but it, the more and more complex the setup is or the environment is the topology or uh, the protocols that you are using then they may start to differ it depends upon their uh, implementation internally. To a good extent uh, they would have followed for example if you are TC using certain version of TCP both implementation should follow the same thing. But sometimes they may do things a little bit different because they I mean this being coded by people like you and me itself it is not that uh, some uh, someone is going to check the correctness of it against uh, the TCP standard that is being followed. Uh, in that context let me also tell uh, one very useful feature of NS2 uh, this is just an information and I think we are also al also out of time so this is the last piece of information. Um, NS2 has a nice thing called cradle. Uh, so it in its implementation is a rather installation is a little bit tricky, but uh, it is doable many people have done it. What it does is you could feed actual implementation uh, packets. So for example, you run a web browser within your host uh, and it is generating uh, packets and they are going down the protocol stack. So if they go through TCP, they go through IP and so on. And you can feed these implementation in other words actual packets that are being generated by your machine into NS2 simulator. And you could for example, uh, so let us say there is a host and a destination. Uh, so what you do is at the application level you have a server and a client running at the user space maybe using socket programming or whatever it is you want they are generating packets. And you are routing this packets via NS2 where NS2 you could implement a 10 hop network or 20 hop network or anything complex, but the traffic that is being fed into NS2 is actually coming from the kernel space. Uh, so this is very useful for example if you want to capture the real implementation artifacts. For example if you want to use a real TCP implementation and not the implementation that has come with NS2 you could do this. So this goes by the name network cradle. So you could uh, google it and uh, uh, look into it. So with this we will close the uh, session.